<laughs> not that often, maybe once a year or so. I'm able to come by. I drove in this morning from uh, Bucks County, north to Philadelphia. And uh, you may remember um, I've been friends with the Zabolskis for many years. First, first uh, faith. Grew up, we grew up in the same home church in the Philadelphia area, and then I met Terry at Bible school and seminary, and uh, he's had, they've had a big impact on my life. But um, I was scheduled to come here in, uh, back in April, I think it was, and my wife and I were going to make a weekend out of it, you know, and then everything got canceled. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to bring my wife here in various visits. The first time I was here, I was on the Appalachian Trail. I mean, you might remember that several years ago. She's not a hiker, but right now my wife is in uh, California. She's originally from Southern California and uh, taking care of family matters after her mother has passed. Uh, a little while ago, but um, we have three children, and uh, thank the Lord for that. The Lord has been very good to us. I'd like you to turn our attention to the book of Philippians this morning, if you have a Bible. Philippians uh, chapter 2, we, we want to look at a few verses there that have to do with our faith, written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, the other week, about two weeks ago, my daughter-in-law, who's 26 year old, she's been studying uh, for many years, graduate of Liberty University, but it's also done many other um, academic pursuits these last few years. And she's, uh, she just finished a program in, uh, to become a physical therapist assistant. You know, this last semester was a lot of online virtual things, but, and then she finally passed her board exam, so now she's certified. Anyway, all that, she said to me, finally, I can just get a job and go home at night and not have to think about homework. Those of us who've been students remember how nice that was. Okay, so I want to make a spiritual analogy to the fact that, you know, as a Christian, we have homework. Not to sound too negative, but we have a responsibility as followers of Christ. You know, the word disciple in the New Testament, which is used to describe followers of Christ, many times Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you need to take up your cross and follow me. The word in Greek, the original language, disciple, literally means a learner, a pupil. So we are followers of Christ. We are students, and it's full time, and there's no summer break, really. And I thought of that as I was reading this passage, that God gives us a responsibility to keep going and to continue learning. And it's a danger after we've been Christians for many years to kind of coast, you know, or tread water. Or I've reached a certain level and I kind of know what the Christian life looks like and how I'm supposed to act. And we, we can kind of uh, back off in our commitment to learn and to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. There's many passages that talk about our need to keep growing and moving forward and maturing. And this is one of them. And uh, look at verses 12 and 13 to get us started here. We'll probably look at it further down this passage as we go along. But Philippians 2 verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes, and I'm reading from the New International Version. You may have something similar uh, to that, but he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Some great promises there. But notice he says, therefore, that always reflects back to the previous section there's a very well-known section in Philippians 2, right before this, where it may have been a hymn or a statement of faith of the early church, describes Jesus humbling himself and coming down here from the glories of heaven and taking on humanity, taking on the form of a servant, and being obedient to the point of death on the cross for us, and how God highly exalted him, and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So that's a great statement of faith. We have a master. We have a teacher in, in heaven that we put our trust in. Okay, so now he says we need to live out that faith that we have, and we need to keep progressing. Notice he refers to 
the readers as his dear friends. You may remember, if you know uh, the book of Acts, that on one of Paul's missionary journeys, Silas and Paul went to the city of Philippi. That would be in Greece today. So it was actually his first contact in the continent of Europe. And um, along with Timothy and Luke were part of that uh, missionary trip. And they met a group of women who were praying down by the river, remember? And th this is how the church in Philippi started. So he started the church. He has a very close relationship with them. And um, you notice this is not a, a strong uh, letter of correction. Paul is very warm. He's very encouraging in this letter. He refers to them as dear friends. You've always obeyed. And he's prodding them on, however, to move ahead in their faith and go deeper and keep on growing. So <clears throat> running the danger of sounding too negative, I want us to think of the fact that we're students and we have homework to do. That is, we have a responsibility. So I want to gather my thoughts around three questions today. First of all, what is our homework? And secondly, what if it's too difficult? What if it's too much for me to do? And third question is, what does it look like practically to actually live out what the Apostle Paul is telling us to do here? So the first question, what is my homework? He says it very clearly, doesn't he? In verse 12, that they are to continue to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So that's my assignment, is to live out my salvation. Now, Notice he does not say to work for your salvation with fear and trembling, as if they needed to add good works to their faith to be able to reach, hopefully, one day salvation. Okay, now that is taught in some Christian groups, obviously, want to add on to faith good works that you must do in order to obtain your salvation or to maintain it. And every religion in the world, by the way, is uh, somewhere along that line of saying you need to do certain things to please God, to be able to draw close to God. It's only the message of the gospel, the true gospel that we see. It's not because of our works. It's solely because of the work of Jesus Christ and faith that we place in him. So that's not what he's saying. There's, there's a few reasons why that is very clear. First of all, in the beginning of this letter, he addresses the readers in Philippi as saints, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. That's the first verse of this letter. So the word saint in Greek literally means holy ones. It's the same word that we use for holy. Okay, so these believers in Philippi were already holy. That is, they were forgiven already of their sins. And you notice they weren't new believers or immature believers. He says in verse 12, as you have always obeyed, so they are pretty far along in their faith, it sounds like. They've been, they have a history of following the teachings of the gospel and the teachings that the Apostle Paul uh, had brought them. He says, you've always obeyed. I, want, I need you to continue. He's not talking to them about how to obtain their salvation. That's why it's translated, work out your salvation, not work for. By the way, there's also another argument here is that the word salvation sometimes is used in, a, in the New Testament in a final sense. That is, to indicate the time when salvation is completed and we're with the Lord and our struggle with sin is over. Not just salvation right now, from forgiveness from the penalty of sin. You might remember the verse in Romans 13 where Paul says, um, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, he wasn't saying to the Roman believers that they weren't saved. He was just referring to that final completion of salvation. When we're with the Lord, it's nearer every day. So there is a sense when salvation can indicate our arrival with the Lord Jesus. But in any case, um, this is not referring to that. The, the New Living Translation that I really like, uh, as far as a simple, very readable translation, renders this verse like this. Put into action God's saving work in your lives. In other words, you've been saved. We need to live it out, and we need to keep progressing. That's our homework. And if you notice, Paul makes it very clear that this is a process. This is not a one-time event. This is a continual process of growth. 
Sometimes we think that, oh, the Holy Spirit is going to give me a shot in the arm, you know, to, to push me along and to render me more spiritual or closer to the Lord. Something like an Acts 2 experience where God's Spirit overwhelms me. Okay, that is not the picture here nor in the New, in the New Testament of continual growing closer to the Lord and, and seeking to make uh, progress in godliness and Christ-likeness. Peter ended his letters in the New Testament, that is 2 Peter, the very last verse. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the, the last words that he left with us, was to keep on growing. Sometimes it's referred to in the New Testament as sanctification, and it's a process of becoming more like Jesus. Do you notice he said in this verse, to continue to work at your salvation. That places a responsibility also on me and not just on God, like it's going to happen. My role is passive. No, he's prodding us to make this our commitment and our passion, not just a hobby when we have time, sort of like I do uh, gardening, you know, when I feel like it. But this needs to be our overriding passion and full-time job is to grow closer to the Lord, to grow more like Jesus. Another thing I wanted to mention here in, in verse 12, he, t he refers to our motivation of why we're doing this. You notice he says, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Now here he's referring to what our motivation should not be. He's saying, I'm not telling you this so you can please me because you're going to see me. Okay, this is something that you need to do whether I'm here or not. Now Paul was like a father figure to them, spiritually speaking. He refers to them as dear friends. He's the one who founded the church. He makes it very clear, we're not striving towards godliness or Christ-likeness because other people are watching, because we want to impress people in church, or we need to give a good example to our children. As helpful as that is, that's not to be our main motivation. What is our motivation here in verse 12? We need to work it out with fear and trembling. He's talking about our relationship with God. And remember that our lives are open to our Maker. And our, our attitude should be one of great respect and awe of our God. That's what really should be pushing and motivating us. That might sound harsh to describe our relationship with God as one of fear and trembling. It sounds almost like we're afraid of God. And, you know, the Muslim faith, for example, I'm told, you know, would never use language of God being a father that's much too friendly. And we need to balance this off. We, we do know that God refers to himself as a good shepherd, as a caring father. Jesus referred to himself as our, our friend. Okay, however, on the other side, there's a balance. We need to remember that God is also a just and holy judge. And the phrase fearing God is very common in the Old Testament as describing a person of faith. That is, we approach God with a fear, with a great respect. We take seriously disobeying him. And we should be moved to sorrow when we do that and not take uh, of our relationship with God in a flippant manner as we would with a friend, uh, just a human being friend. You know, it's much more serious than that. I don't know if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, like I am, and especially the Chronicles of Narnia. Remember those? I mean, they're, they're more than just kid stories. You know, they really bring out a lot of spiritual truth. And there's an illustration on this point that... C.S. Lewis brought out in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And those of you who know the story know this. I'll explain it to the others. But Jesus is pictured by a lion named Aslan. <clears throat> and there's four human kids who enter into this world of Narnia. And they haven't, yet, they haven't met Aslan yet, the lion. They've heard about it. And they're talking with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in this story about meeting Aslan. And... One of the humans says, I feel nervous about meeting a lion. And Mrs. Beaver says, that you will be, dearie. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, 
They're either braver than most or just plain silly. So Lucy, one of the humans, says, then he, then he isn't safe? And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Okay, so that, that conversation is a classic illustration of bringing these two truths together. That our God is good, he's loving, he's caring. He calls us to draw near to him, but at the same time, he's a lion. He's, this is a serious relationship that we need to take him with great respect. As the writer of Hebrews says, he's a consuming fire. And the Apostle Paul here brings that out. Sometimes we lose that. We love to emphasize the one side of that, of what God can do for us, his care for us. And we forget that he's our king. And we need to bow down before him and take this relationship very seriously. So Paul says here, we need to continue living out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that is a great re reminder to me. Now, the second question I said I wanted to get to was, well, what if it's too much? You know, it's not easy to live out our faith with all the opposition that we face. We face a world that is not following Christ. We, we mingle and we live around people who don't have faith in Jesus Christ. We have an enemy who's actively working, Satan, with his army to try to discourage and get me off track. You know, the job is very difficult. Sometimes I want to give up. And I know many people over the years who have drifted away from their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for various reasons. So the Apostle Paul is encouraging us to continue. And not, he doesn't just tell us to do that, but he gives us the key in verse 13 to when it gets tough. What does he say? It's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So when we feel weak, he reminds us that it's not our strength. If God calls us to live out our faith and to make progress and to stand up for Jesus, he's going to provide the resources that are necessary to do that. We, this is a reminder that we need to lean on him. And this is a description of, of two ministries of the Holy Spirit that works inside of us if we're believers in Jesus Christ. He gives us one strength to do, to act, he says here. We sang about that. Acts 1.8, Jesus promised you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses. And secondly, what does he say? He also works in us to will to do his good purpose. So here God is talking about renewing our desire to do what is right and what pleases him. This, I think, is oftentimes overlooked in our struggle with sin, that God wants to change and work inside of us to give us that thirst for righteousness, that desire to do what pleases him. And some of those old desires that we had before we knew Christ, or desires that other people have that are not following Christ, God can take those away, and they tend to fade and become less important to us as we spend time and get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. This reminds me of that well-known verse in Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that doesn't necessarily just mean, oh, I'm going to get everything that I want. God modifies our desires, and he works from that area of our life, our will, so that we want to please him. So we need to ask God to do that more and more in our lives as we spend time with him. Now, the third question is, what does this look like? What does sanctification look like in very practical terms? So he goes on in the following verses to describe some ways that God wants to work in our lives as we commit to following and growing and doing our homework. Let's read verses 14, 15, and 16. The Apostle Paul says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation 
in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. So he goes through a list of various ways that God wants to work and things he wants to bring out in our life as we, we grow. Isn't it interesting and amazing even that he starts off with doing everything without complaining or arguing? Now, I don't know if you've heard this, but sometimes Christians complain, you know? And why is it that we fall into that so easily of uh, complaining, of arguing, of being ungrateful? Sometimes it's little things that can bother us and take away the joy that God wants to give us. But it's really interesting how that is a centerpiece in many verses in the New Testament of our walk with God. This is to be a basic description of a mature Christian. It's contentment. Our pastor's been preaching through Colossians, and Colossians 2, there's a very key passage about the same subject of growing in our faith. It says in verse 6 in Colossians 2, So then, just as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, so this is describing a Christian with deep roots in Jesus Christ. And he says, and overflowing with thankfulness. Exaggerating in being thankful. Now, getting back to Philippians 2.14, there's one word in this verse that makes this very difficult to put into practice. That really trips us up. Otherwise, this would not be that hard to put into practice. What's the word? Everything. <laughs> Everything we need to do without complaining. You know, and that, that becomes very difficult. This is where we need God to really work in our hearts. I was, for me this week, you know, the little thing that trips me up and was bothering me was going down the basement on Monday morning and finding what's all this water around damaging things in my basement. It's not supposed to be here. You know, I traced it back to my water heater dripping. And, you know, I'm not really using much hot water in the summer, but it was dripping, and, you know, the, it's not that old. The, called the plumber in, and, well, it's, I'm sorry, it's not under warranty any longer. You know, it's going to have to be replaced, you know. Oh, by the way, we can't replace it right away. You know, little irritations that take away our joy. You know, if anybody had a, a reason to complain, it was the Apostle Paul who's writing this letter. You do realize that he's in prison as he's writing Philippians, as he is also with Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon. He tells us throughout this letter that he's in chains unjustly, by the way, for preaching the gospel. I wonder if he was thinking, Lord, I thought I was doing your will. What am I doing here? You know, in Philippi, this church was born in the, in the midst of persecution and hard times. Paul, if you remember, if you know Acts 16, he and Silas were, were flogged. They were beaten. <clears throat> That's the same treatment that Jesus got. And I'm sure their backs were torn up without a trial, without asking if they were Roman citizens. You're not allowed to flog Roman citizens without a trial. And thrown into prison, it says the deepest, you know, the most central part of the prison in Philippi, and <clears throat> their feet and their hands put in stocks as if they were dangerous criminals. That's when the, <clears throat> the Lord sent an earthquake at midnight, remember, to free them. And do you remember what they were doing at midnight in the prison? Singing hymns, right? Praising the Lord. If anybody had a reason to complain, wouldn't it be him? Apostle Paul and Silas? How, why is God allowing all this? See, and the, Paul actually writes in the fourth chapter of Philippians, I've learned the secret of contentment. So even the Apostle Paul had to learn that. There he refers to the fact that even he is a student. He said, I had to learn to live with very little. I've lived with little. I've lived with plenty. I've learned the secret of contentment. And that's when he goes on the very well known, the most, probably most well known verse in the book of Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's actually talking about contentment in the context of that verse. 
I can look, I've learned to be thankful in whatever the Lord sends my way. Because did you notice at the end of verse 13, Paul talked about the will that God gives us to act according to his good purpose. So what God allows in our life is for a purpose, and it's a good purpose. It's not always a fun purpose, but it's a good purpose. We don't always see it at first, how God is using all things for his good purpose to those that love him. Romans 8, 28 talks about that also. So we need, to, we need to learn that secret, to lean on the Lord in hard times, to watch our tongues, to watch our attitudes, and ask God's help to put into practice what he's commanded. First Thessalonians 5, 18, you know, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And he, he wants to help us to do that. What else does he say here about living out our faith? Verse 15, so that you may become blameless, pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. But you shine like stars in the universe. Now he describes the world that we live in, the difficult that we, difficulty that we have, that they had at that time was crooked and perverse. And we, were, we are to live differently. He's not talking about sinless perfection, otherwise he wouldn't need to write to them about areas in their life uh, that need improving. He's talking about being upright. Sometimes this word blameless is translated above reproach in the passages about church leaders. In other words, being consistent in our talk, with our, our walk and talk, being um, not hypocritical in our lives that we're living, as Christians, we're to be consistent in our testimony to the world that's watching. And he says that we live in a crooked, or they were living in a crooked and perverse generation. Do you think that's true today? That's a reason for us to start complaining many times, because we see things getting worse and worse in the world that we live in, our society, our nation, many troubling things. I just, you know, started Googling and coming up with some statistics about some very sad things that are happening and have, been, have happened for a long time in our country. Here's one. This goes back a few years, but the American Psychological Association said that the average child in the United States has watched 8,000 televised murders and 100,000 acts of violence before finishing elementary school. And, you know, we have one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. Here's a quote from a well-known person who said, What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. They ride in the streets inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What's going to happen to them? You know who wrote that? That was Plato back in... 400 years before Christ. <laughs> Just to say, Paul, <laughs> Paul can describe the world as being corrupt and dark because human nature doesn't change. It's not dark. It's not crooked because of our politics or because of various social problems. Okay, We live in a dark world and we always have because of sin nature that is stubborn and selfish, and people have always think that we can make it without faith in God. And they want to go the opposite direction instead of bowing the knee to Jesus Christ. That's why we live in a dark world. But the good news is, the solution is, is that God wants to use us as stars shining in a, in a dark world. Now, when you came in today and you were outside, did you notice the stars up in the sky? No, I didn't see them. Did you see them last night? Yes. By the way, if the world is not dark, you don't see the stars. They're only effective in the darkness. In fact, the darker it is, the better you see the stars, and the more impact and influence they can have. That's why when you're out on a camping trip or something, you say, wow, what a sky. You know, it's the same sky that's up there when you're in Harrisburg or when I'm near Philadelphia and there's all these lights and you can't really see very well. It's the same sky. 
But the stars become more effective and have a greater impact the darker it is. So instead of complaining, we need to realize that things are getting bad in our country, sure. Not that they've ever been, you know, great. We see a lot of negative trends, or we have a lot of difficulties. We have difficult co-workers or neighbors or whatever. Look, this is more opportunity, the Apostle Paul is saying, for Christians to shine like stars and reflect the light of Jesus. I mean, Jesus said the same thing, let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works and glorify God. Right? This is, Paul is saying this is increased opportunity for us to live differently. If we become like the world, our light is ineffective. He's called us to be different. That's hard sometimes. Not everyone's going to like us. So we need to ask, ask the Lord to give us bright lights and to shine wherever he places us. There's something I wanted to bring out about that. I slipped my mind for the moment, but He goes on to say, however, as part of shining our lights in this world, you notice verse 16, as you hold out the word of life. What's he referring to, the word of life? It's the word of God, the truth of God. So part of shining like stars is not only showing compassion and love to people around us who don't know the Lord, but it's also not being ashamed to speak truth. As Paul said in Ephesians, speaking the truth in love. We have the answer. We have what this world needs in the darkness that they're struggling with. That's why suicide rates are so high, by the way, this, even in just this past year. As people struggle with the changes, with, with fears about the epidemic. Okay, we have the hope. We have truth that this world needs. And Paul refers to it as the word of life that gives hope and life. And it's getting harder to stand up and speak truth and not be criticized or hated for it. Even. But Paul's calling, if that's part of our calling, is to balance those two things, love and a consistent Christian life with truth. Is that's really what our world needs in the darkness. And so we need to ask God for strength, to, to not be ashamed to stand up Sometimes I feel intimidated. We had new neighbors move in recently, and we decided we got to not be afraid of our responsibility to step out. So, you know, we took food over. We invited them over one night for pizza, and we're not afraid, you know, to pray and to share a little bit of our faith. And a friendship relationship has opened up because of that which I'm praying it will lead to more opportunities to talk about our faith. To take initiative to speak up for the Lord is how he wants to use us. And just in closing, he just touches the Apostle Paul in some other areas of what living out our faith is going to entail. He talks about verse 17, on being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I mean, this is Old Testament sacrifice language. The Apostle Paul here seems to be hinting about the fact that his life may be ending soon, but he dedicated to serving other people and starting this group of believers in Philippi as God used him. Just uh, an encouragement there about serving others and sacrificing is part of our Christian walk. And he gets into the subject of joy. I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. Verse 18, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. That's a theme of Philippians. You may know that is joy and joy in the Lord. And again, the Apostle Paul would be one person that could have an excuse not to be joyful. But throughout this letter, he emphasizes the joy that God wants to give us. So homework, now growing up as I was a student, it wasn't considered a joy. Okay, but this is different. This is homework for the Lord as we're in his classroom and learning from him. And God wants to make it a joy to live out our faith. 
and to progress. It's much more joyful than being a stale Christian and just trying to maintain a veneer, an outside impression of how a Christian is supposed to be, rather than a vital, growing walk with the Lord, taking time and effort to walk with the Lord and seeking to live in His power and the desires that He gives us to live out our Christian life. That's a joyful experience. And if you're like me, you know, there's some time periods where I'm doing that and I'm living out that and enjoying it. And there's other times where I get tripped up with the busyness of life, with the discouragements, and my Christian life can become stale. So let's ask the Lord to help, help us to maintain that freshness and that vitality in our relationship with Him and make progress. Would you close in prayer with me? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for salvation that you offer to us freely. And as we all struggle to live that out, Lord, and to live life without complaining, to be lights in the universe where you've called us to be, I pray that you would empower us, Lord, that you would teach us more to lean on you, the Holy Spirit's work in our life, to bring glory to our Lord and Savior. So help us, Lord, to take advantage of opportunities to shine this week and to maintain a strong relationship with you. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.